the amount of math and physics and science that is involved with what most contractors do is staggering to me. And the financials that apparently, and I'm being sarcastic here, seem to be so far over most contractors' heads, right, is literally sales bigger than expenses equals a profit. That is the math. So it has to be the emotional issues that keep us from doing it. The math is not hard. You know, like it isn't the math that's keeping you from being good at your financials. You're listening to Toolbox of the Trades, brought to you by Service Titan, a podcast for top service professionals where we interview leaders for their best tips and tricks of the trades. Learn how industry trailblazers stay ahead of the competition and how you too can be at the forefront of an industry. Let's jump in. Hello, contractors, and welcome to the Toolbox for the Trades. Today, you have the privilege of hearing from the financial trade wizard herself, Ellen Rohr. In her incredibly impressive career, Ellen's gone from sinking her husband's plumbing business to creating dozens of successful franchises and helping contractors across the globe make sense of their finances. We talked about the pros and cons of going into business with your spouse, the importance of open book management, getting clear on what you want in your career, and how to build a successful turnkey service company. To learn more about Ellen, go to servicetitan.com slash podcast. Enjoy. Ellen Rohr, welcome to the Toolbox for the Trades. What? Hey. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, um, full disclosure to everyone listening, I have a relationship with Ellen. We've chatted quite a bit in the past, and you have an incredible trade career from partnering up with your husband to run his business to becoming the president of Ben Franklin Plumbing, the punctual plumber, to your current title now, which is the president of Zoom Drain, plus business consultant, plus contributor to dozens of different trade publications. So I would just like to ask you the question I'm asking everyone. How did you get in the trades? I married into it. I married into it. And I went, growing up, my dad wasn't handy. You know, so many people have those stories of growing up within the, the trades. You know, we had, you know, the wherewithal to call people and we did. So, you know, when I was a kid, I thought when you flushed the toilet, it was a miracle. And that, you know, you turn the, the heating system was the thermostat on the wall. Like I am that knuckleheaded customer. And it wasn't until I married my husband, his name's Hot Rod, which you know, and how do you resist that? So I married him and he's a plumber. His dad was a plumber. He didn't want to be a plumber. He was just going to plumb until he figured out what he wanted to do. And now he's 67. So that happened. So um, he was the one who, once we, we got married and I, st- I started to you know, hang out with them, bring lunch on the job, see the, the, the job sites and meet the other tradespeople, like the lightning wranglers, the electricians, and the people who make weather, the HVAC guys. It was never lost on me how amazing what they did was. Like, they thought it was normal, and I did not. Like, I was just absolutely flabbergasted by what they knew, how they could put stuff together, watching a house go up from, you know, bare land to this, you know, building. I was always really in love with them. And what I love about tradespeople is what I love about my husband, you know, someone who works with his hands. They have a very low baloney tolerance. I'm going to keep it clean. <laughs> uh, you know, so they're, they're just, they're, they're salt of the earth people. It's either right or it's wrong. They're, I just love tradespeople. And that's how I got born into it. And then I, I probably never would have worked with my husband except for, I, you know, the story too. My husband, his best friend and his partner literally worked himself into a health crisis and died at age 33. And that's when I like thought, well, wait, what? How did that happen? I thought he was a hypochondriac. I thought he was just, oh, relax. It's not, you know, but he he literally was not in good health. He worked himself into this stress induced health crisis and he died one weekend. He got sick and died. And, um, So that, you know, that had an impact on me. You know, it's not worth that. It's not worth sacrificing your health and your relationships for business. You know, there's got to be a way to love on each other no matter what. I'm feeling a little emotional today. I'm kind of an emotional person anyway. 
But uh, just, you know, talking about that always kind of reminds me of what, you know, let's keep the main thing, the main thing. But I thought, you know, then the, the, the really ridiculous part of my career is because I'm college educated, because I had a whole bunch of jobs, I've had a lot of jobs. And at the time, I had moved up the ranks in a restaurant chain. I was, uh, you know, 27 years old. I was responsible for a lot of people. We used numbers. I thought I knew what I was doing. And so I told my husband, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to come work for you after, you know, after Yox's partner had died, you turn wrenches, I'll count the money. It's going to be easy. We're going to get rich. And then it was absolute sheer awfulness for the next few years. So, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I, you know, one of the things that I want to uh, point out too, is when I tell this story, it sounds like, and then I got my mentor, Frank Blau, he told me to raise my prices and I did it. He told me to raise my prices and it was a year later that I raised my prices. Yeah. You know, that, that like it is with no judgment, only love that I come off as a know-it-all here. And so I've heard this story before and um, I definitely want to get into you know, first off, that's so unfortunate about what happened to your husband's business partner. And, you know, he was your husband's business partner. So he obviously was your friend. And, mm -hmm. you know, in my time working at Service Titan, I see men and women who just give their lives to their businesses. And what we try to do is we try to provide them with the tools they need so they can finally free themselves of their business. And I'm sure just in your line of consultant work, you've seen people like Hot Rod's former business partner who are just working themselves to the bone and are just really suffering at the expense of their business. So talk to me a little bit about how taking over for Hot Rod's partner, what that did for you personally, and also what that did for your relationship, if you don't mind, because there's a lot of people in the trades now who do the husband and wife duo partnership. And some, for a lot of people, it works out great for some people, yeah. not so much. And I know for you, you guys specifically made the decision once you got on stable footing to go your separate ways. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Like kind of yes, crunchy and time? married. Sometimes I tell the story and they're like, Oh, I'm sorry you got divorced. And I'm like, Oh no, I am actually still married. I can't believe it, but I am one day at a time, man, one foot on the banana peel. I've been married for 36 years. I don't think I would be married if we still were together. But so what happened is, you know, at this point, then there are motivating reasons, you know, why you're going to make changes in your life. And at that time, I heard an expression that really hit me between the eyes that when the pain of the current condition becomes greater than the fear of change, you'll change. That's one way to make changes is just like whatever you're afraid of, could it be worse than what you're currently living with? And that's where we got in the business. I mean, because once I quit my job, we didn't have my salary, you know, now it was doubly, doubly doomed. It was so tough. And when I would say, we don't have enough money, my husband would hear, you're not good enough. Like the languaging is so challenging and I didn't know how much. So it was really, you know, like the, um, skill set that my mentor Frank Blau taught me to just keep score, just keep track of the money is really the, the foundation of everything that I've done since. And it's not very complicated. I am not the world's greatest financial mind. I am vanilla ice cream across the board. Like we just do the basics and the basics absolutely work. I'm an Occam's razor fan. I'm just a, you know, what is the what is the activity that we could take right now that's going to have the least amount of effort and the biggest impact? And when it comes to your business, knowing the financials, no bad thing comes of it. And that's what Frank taught me. And it took me a while. I was a, I was a slow learner. So uh, once I did raise my prices, once the pain of that current condition was so big and we thought, great, we'll go out of business, but we're not going to do this. We raised our prices and we just started making money. Now, again, there were some hiccups. Did I ever tell you about the first day of flat rate for us? No. And just to make sure that everyone is clear, you and Hot Rod, when you took over the business, you weren't charging enough. That's right. correct. You right. had wrote to Frank Blau, who had published an article in a trade magazine, and you were like, yep. it's not working. And he just wrote back to you and was like, you're not charging enough. And you- He called me. He called you. He called me and told me where my head was. Right? And like, this was right out, kaboom, hit me with a brick. I'm crying, you know, hung up on him. 
called him back the next day, you know, the whole bit, like he, he's a nut. And, uh, you know, but I, I needed that, you know, some people need a feather, some people need a brick. I apparently needed a brick and that's what I got. And, you know, he was the first one to just say, you think you're so smart, but sister, you are blowing it and it's your responsibility to fix it. And it's not what I wanted to hear. I wanted to blame everybody else, starting with my husband and the team and the customers and the economy and blah, 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 you know, all that. So he was the one who just, you know, kind of extreme ownership me into taking responsibility for the situation. So when we raised our prices, it was a Friday. I figured I'd clean the guys up. If we're going to raise our prices, we should be better. I'm finally going to take the leap. So we have our um, three service techs, not even hot rod. Hot rod's like, like on the background, leading, leading from behind at this point. The two of us are just like, this will never work. The three guys are standing there like eyes like this and I give them each a, a dispatch and they say, okay, I've got a new little price book printed up on a piece of paper. Here you go. They've got uniforms on. The uniform was a chambray shirt and jeans, you know, the the tuxedo, the denim the Canadian, tuxedo. the Canadian yeah. tuxedo. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a, which is a step up from one of my guys used to wear to work a t-shirt that said, kill them all, let God sort them out. Oh, geez. It was an upgrade. It was an upgrade. So there they are. They're standing there and hand them out the dispatch. This is how the state went down. One of those customers threatened to call the attorney general of the state of Utah. Another one did call the Better Business Bureau. And the third one, the third call was to my babysitter's house. And my babysitter had my child there when she called me sobbing. How could you rip me off this way? That was day one of raising our prices. So if you're afraid it won't go well, it might not. <laughs> well, so you never told me this story. So is that crazy? That is insane. So how did you how did you stick with it? Because so, imagine well, if it took you so long to make that change and you were so scared about raising your prices, if you got those first three calls, you might have been like, you know what? Nope, abort, abort, like changing back the strategy. It. That was it. Like I, we were psyched. Tatra and I were like, that didn't work. Told you, like knew it wouldn't. That was a disaster. Spent the whole weekend planning our new life. And on Monday we come into the office and the three guys, you know how they have the meeting after your meeting out by their cars in the parking lot. And, uh, they'd had one of those meetings and they came in and they said, we get what you're trying to do. We can do, see, I'm emotional today. We can do this. And really that was the, the beginning of the beginning, you know, that, and, and that path, like, so if I were to say, you got to know your numbers. The second thing I would say is open book management. It, so what happened is I showed them how I came up with those numbers. I, well, I don't know how else to do it. Frank taught me to add all my costs, divide it by number of billable hours, charge more than that. So I just showed it to him. I showed him it was on like columnar pad, 10 key. I do this because I was just using a 10 key to figure it out. And then I went to the seminar, The Great Game of Business. I read the book. I went to the seminar and Jack Stack. Mm -hmm. So this guy had written a book called The Great Game of Business, which was about open book management, which was essentially share relevant, real financial information with your team, which wasn't how I grew up. You didn't show people anything, you know? So that was kind of extraordinary. And it just, it, it helped with the why, with the buy-in, with the trust, you know? So since that day, I've, I've always preached and tried to hold myself accountable and my team members accountable for being impeccable with the financials and then sharing relevant, real information with your team. Now that can take different forms, but just they gotta know. Just tell them the truth and tell them what's relevant to what they're doing. That's a good place to start. That's so. so that's Not so made a big difference. Yeah. And I love how your text came in on Monday after that, like botched <laughs> price raise. And they essentially were like, no, we're here for you. We're going to make this work. And I imagine that just giving them that transparency allowed them to communicate with your customers. Like, actually, this is why it's cost it. Like, this is why it costs as much as it does. So once you had buy-in from your techs, once they got that transparency, what kind of curve did you see as you guys went over the next couple of weeks? It just, we just started to make money right away. So like you got to get priced right and you got to, as soon as you buy it, as soon as your team buys it. So why doesn't a price increase work at companies? From my experience has been that the owner doesn't believe it and neither do the techs. Because once the owner and the techs and the team believes it, you're off to the races. 
you know, and my son, like it's funny, younger kids now, probably all over service Titan. Why wouldn't you charge a premium price for what we do? Like they, they don't even get it. Why would you do that for cut rate prices? You know, and that's why like we're in a whole different world now, 30 plus years later than, you know, than it used to be. And I, you know, I, I love to give credit to my buddy Frank because he was the one who turned me on to a better way and many of the rest of us. So some like I'm considered like an elder statesman now, but there's a whole bunch of us that learned from Frank Blau and George Brazil and Mike Diamond and some of these guys who right out of the gate early on started to find a different way uh, to create honorable, profitable businesses. Yeah. And why wouldn't you? Try? Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, as far as I can, as far in my time recording this podcast and my time working for Service Titan, I am just blown away by the incredible business sense and entrepreneurship of our customers. And I'm just kicking myself for not becoming like a uh, HVAC comfort advisor as a woman. Yeah. Um, no, there's some great careers to be had here, right? And yeah. now I think now is really, uh, it's better than ever. And, and so, yeah, so there you know, these things. So then another point to make is find a mentor, find a, an association or a group that feels like home, you know, some place where you're going to hang out with people who are like-minded, you know, who have the same goals, who are going to share information. That was also part of my development. You know, yeah. that I, I had to get outside what I knew and start looking at other industries and other ways that people in our industry were, were kicking it in business as opposed to the status quo. And what I think is so interesting about that is you had a, a degree in business administration. So you had, you were college educated, you had mm -hmm. all of those skills, but you still needed to and need to have that self-motivation, you still need to be a self-starter to go and find this trade-specific information that required you to get like an MBA in trade school, kind of. Right. For sure. And I, I'm a big fan of higher education. If you can afford it, I don't, our industry, I have not seen that having a college degree is, in, is the characteristic required to be successful. Yeah. Most of the guys I know do not have college degrees. So college is awesome. I don't want to disparage college, but it's a whole different life, uh, the life of an entrepreneur or in the, you know, the life of a tradesperson. So you want to find people specific to what you do, who've done what you've done. If one has done it, someone else can do it, you know, that just to, to break that four minute barrier as it were. Gotcha. So, so yeah, so that, that started to help. So we started to make more money. And this is like the, the, the last thing I want to say about like my um, metamorphosis, finally getting a clue, as Frank said, pulling my head out, <laughs> uh, would be that once you get some breathing room, like the financial piece of it is just like oxygen. Zig Ziglar says that money isn't everything, but it's right up there with oxygen. It, you know, it is required for you to be able to do much else. And so once we got, you know, dug out of debt and started to stockpile some money and started to see how we could consistently make money, I was thinking, let's, we were in Park City, Utah. Let's go to Salt Lake. I know where the rich people are. I know all the neighborhoods I want to go to. I, we got this. And so I turned to my husband and it was his business. And I said, what do you want? And he said, I want to work all by myself. And that, like, as I tell it now, that was easy. So we decided to do separate things, separate things. It was completely emotional and hard at the time because I was very vested in blaming my husband for my lack of success. Mm. That was the big lesson there. I spent, you know, almost 20 years in my marriage wanting him to be different. And I know I'm not the only person who has done that in a relationship but when I relapse, it's that where I'm trying to get someone else to do what I want them to do instead of staying in my own hula hoop and deciding what I will tolerate, what I can do. Those are the choices you can make there. But for me, that was the biggie of in terms of we are all allowed to do what we want to do. And how are we going to make that happen? My dream wasn't his. So then, you know, I'm a boat afloat. We sell our company to our employees in uh, Park City. And you know, they still roll those trucks in Park City, Utah. It makes me very proud. 
And uh, we move out to the country. I live on 60 acres in a farm. And then I'm like, uh, we kind of went middle-aged crazy. And Hot Rod started his own business. And you know, I was sure that he would be terrible without me. And he wasn't. How rude is that? You know, just like all these things, like whatever your experiences are, they just layer on. And if you're lucky like me, you get to be old and they build up. You know, just so you will see in your life, don't you already? Like all those things you've done really set the stage for where you are now and the options that you have from this point of power. So, yeah. you know, this all, this all, it all just built. And so this is when I started to, to take responsibility for my life. What am I going to do? How can I serve? What are my gifts? And I started, you know, I wrote, where did the money go and how much did I charge skinny books with pictures to teach the basic finance stuff I learned. And I wish someone had shown me like, how can I serve? It's really was the impetus of this. I started sharing like what I know from my experience, strength and hope, as they say, this is what I can do. And it was, I, you know, that's how I, um, it worked my way into this amazing career where I've worked for a lot of associations. I've worked for almost all the franchises. I wrote for a bunch of magazines. I, you know, it's, I just had this awesome opportunity to learn this business in this kind of fast tracked way. Worked for Benjamin Franklin. I was doing a seminar. I got approached by the venture capitalist and they said, do you want to run the country's largest home service plumbing company? And I said, yes. And I had no reason to say yes. So another tip like is if you get clear on what you want, I knew I wanted to see if I had the chops to do this on a bigger level. I just didn't know how to do it. And I thought it was going to be with our own business and it wasn't. So when you get clear on what you want, stuff comes from the left or the right out of nowhere that is aligned with that. And then you can say yes. Like yeah. I wouldn't have guessed that was going to happen. I, you know I mean? Yeah, I mean, you're just, you're just spitting out like just wisdom, like every other sentence. And I'm, I'm here and I'm actively listening. And I'm also, the more I talk to you, the more I realize that we get along, like why we get along. <laughs> You're an adventurer. I am an adventurer. I am too. Um, yeah. What I, what I'm really, what I've heard in the last couple of minutes of you talking is within your relationship of managing a business together, both you and your husband got very clear on what you both wanted. And it made sense in that case to go your separate ways. But then because you were very clear and honest and upfront about what you wanted, that relationship was able to be preserved. It also sounds like as you got more clear on what you wanted, all of these opportunities started presenting themselves themselves to you and gave you the path for Benjamin Franklin. And I, I like that you say, I had no business saying yes to that position. So talk to me kind of about what that was like to take that role on, not knowing whether or not you could do it, like what that kind of risk felt like and, and, and what you would give, what kind of advice you would give to other people who may be in that same position right now. So the next, like, um, what I know for sure, like what I know, like I know. I, I picture you, by the way, having a list of like things I've learned and know for sure. Things I know, like Oprah does that whole thing, what I know for sure at the end of her magazine articles. I bought one of her books that just had all those little essays. So there are some things that I know for sure, not a lot, but here's, and here's one. So I take on this job and I am so over my head, so over my head. I have to figure out how to create a franchise. I have help. I have mentors, but like I haven't done any of this stuff before. And I have to write an operations manual and I have to sell people on something that does not exist. It's going to be totally cool. We don't have a model center. We don't have anybody in it. You're going to be the first one want to sign up. Like that was my sales presentation at first. But as you start to clarify, what does that look like? What are the opportunities? And I did, I worked with a pretty powerful group of people. So it wasn't like I was the only one. I was in charge of this piece of it. What happened as we started to get a little bit of traction is I didn't know how to run a plumbing company. I didn't know what would go in the manual. So I wrote along with the text and I sat side by side with the front frontline people in some ways to avoid doing whatever work it was I was supposed to be doing. And I would ask them questions like, I am in charge. Can you believe that? And I don't know how to do this. So if you were me, 
what do you think I should do? I am in a power, I am in a position of power. Like I can create it. Well, I don't know what it should be. So what are you being asked to do right now? That doesn't make any sense. What do you hate about your job? What do you love about your job? What is just the dumbest idea? Every dumb idea was something that at one point I had pushed out in my own company or recommended to someone, you get on the front lines and they just tell you, you know why that's dumb? You fill it out here and you fill it out here. Now, why do we have to do it twice? Like they come up with this really good stuff or, you know, what the most important thing is to them. And, and, you know, I just, that was like the smartest thing I did. And I did it through survival. And I, anytime I'm lost I go try and go back to the truck and back to the side by sides and just sit with people and get clear about what is happening. Harry Friedman told me this once and I love it. At the end of the day, all I care about is what is happening between our team member and our customer. That's all I care about. So like, if you, again, just go to the basics. If we can make everything that we do should set up that service technician to have a good experience. And that's why we love service tech. You have the same concept. You know, like how do we make it easier for the service technician and the customer, those two people right there, or the service coordinator and the customer, dispatcher and the customer, whatever that face time is or, or virtual time is, how do we take the rocks out of the road? You know, and they tell you, and I wrote it down and that's how we started the manuals. And every time I strayed from that, I got into trouble. And if I got into trouble, I would go back to that, fall on my sword and see if we couldn't fix it. I love that. And this is not the first time people have suggested, by the way, that you need to get into the truck, you need to talk, be on the front lines, and you need to be communicative and transparent with your technicians about what, what's working and what's not. And just mm -hmm. to be clear, while you were at ben, uh, Benjamin Fl Franklin, were you in charge of setting up the franchise program? Yeah, I was the only employee until we had 18 franchises. Wow. Now, we had support from the sister companies. We did have support, you know, because it was part of the whole Clockworks family. But I was the, the Benjamin Franklin person for a minute. And, you know, when I worked there too, so, you know, I left in 2004. It was a lead, follow, get out of the way moment. All of the executives were being required to move to Florida and I didn't want to go. And my dad lived in my barn over here and he's, he was, uh, had Alzheimer's and, you know, I didn't want him to get lost. And he since died. But like one of the things that I, I, that I know about making money is that I can make money. And so when you have that confidence too, like you sell stuff for more than it costs and you can manufacture your own money. Once you have that, it makes it a lot easier to make choices that are aligned with your dreams. Gotcha. And that's what I've learned through all this. I know how to make money. You sell stuff for more than it costs and you take it in cash. <laughs> you know, that, like that kind of understanding really helped me then to leave that company and then again, get lost. Another life crisis. How can I serve? What can I help? And this is when I reached out to my two partners. And currently I am not the president anymore at Zoom Drain. We've restructured our org chart. I am the COO, chief operating officer. Jim is our senior partner. He's the chief executive officer. And then Al Levy is our senior partner as well. So the three of us own it. And Jim is the day-to-day -day driving force. I did a podcast yesterday and I thought, I didn't mention Jim. I want you to know Jim is like the best leader in the world. And I'm so glad to have him and Al Levy who gets his voice out there. But Jim is a lot more, um, less interested in the limelight. <laughs> so I just want to, you know, shout out to them. So I partnered up with them. Jim was a previous client of ours. We really just, I remember saying to Al at one point, I want to do this franchising thing again. I loved it. I grew a little fast. I just didn't want to grow so fast. I wanted to really commit to the, the growth of the, the team members. I felt like it got away from me in some ways. So, you know, you, you experience something, you plan, you execute, you debrief. How are we going to do it different? Plan, execute, debrief. And so Al and I were talking and um, I said to him something like, let's not even try too hard. Let's just magnetize someone who wants to do what we want to do. And as we were saying that, talking that way, Al's phone blows up and it's Jim. And Jim says, I've been thinking, I bet I could franchise this company. Would you guys be interested in helping? And it was just so cool. Like he was the only one we had. We did not set out to do a drain company. We set out to do a, a contracting, you know, a home service company. 
And then Jim was just the right guy at the right time. And then we took a few years to get that house in order really tight. As Al says, if you want it to be lukewarm anywhere else, you have to have it red hot at HQ. Gotcha. It's going to be red hot at HQ for you to even think about expanding out. So, you know, this is when you started Zoom Drain. You mentioned that you want it, it needed to be red hot at HQ in order to be lukewarm elsewhere. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about how you got there and where you guys are now. So like that, the idea of like, if you can see, like if you're in your shop and you can see it, you're going to be, you know, there's a level of control that you have that, that is going to help you as you get these systems in. If the systems weren't ever proven out and we tried to do it remotely, the likelihood of success at a remote location was going to be thin. Right. That just, that's just one element of what it takes to be successful. So we knew we wanted to get these systems dialed in and customized and trained and, and prove them out. And so Jim really, Jim's company, he is our, you know, our senior partner. And um, he's also the largest of the frame. He plays the role of both franchisor and franchisee. So he is our model center. He is our lab. Before we sold the franchises, we wanted to make sure it's good. But since we've sold it, his growth and profits has just been amazing. So we have gotten a lot of validation that, you know, we, we're old at this point. We do have hundreds of years of experience now. And so as we combine that, Al is just an operations man. I put it in, in my pieces of the puzzle, which are the simple financial systems and our compensation and bonus programs. But the manuals are really the foundation of any company that's going to run without you. If it's, if it's not written down, if they can't access those manuals, if you have to tell everybody what to do all day long, it's going to be you and two or three trucks for the rest of your life. So the manuals are really, if you want to, now there's nothing wrong with that. You can do whatever you want. But if your goal is to create a turnkey company, you know, having written procedures. So you, here's how you stock your truck. Here's what your uniform looks like. Here's how you answer the phone. I mean, we have a massive comprehensive manual that we're always trying to trim down. Mm -hmm. Like just fight fancy, get to the basics, give it the 80% that we're going to do every day and empower people to make decisions if it's not in the manual. That is a relentless job and it helps to get some help along those lines. And I did have the best partners in the world to help me put that together. So you talk to the guys, you document it, you delegate it. You guys are going to write a procedure for how to install a Sloan valve and they write it and edit it and you put it in the manual, you hash it out. So that like sloggy process is really required for any company. And for franchising, franchising and, and a turnkey company are very similar. If you want a franchise, for those of you who are listening, you're thinking, I might franchise my company. Well, the same early steps are to get your house in order, get those systems in place, operationally, technically, sales and marketing, financial, admin, chip away at that. Then you can decide whether or not you want to franchise it or expand it with company-owned stores, or maybe it just runs great without you, makes a lot of money, and it's perfect as it is. Generally, things are either growing or dying in the universe, though, so nothing stays the same. But you, you, hear, you hear what I'm saying. Totally. And how many franchises does Zoom Drain have right now? Right now, we're operating out of 18 locations. I love that. 18 locations across the, the franchise. And right now, like, can I share with you what my big um, COVID-19 um, epiphanies have been? Please. I, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I love that I have this career. And so much of it has been a result of associating with just the most amazing people and being smart enough to realize it. You know, I guess that's where my talent is. I recognize talent. I, I love energy. I try and you know, align myself with people who are doing things that I want to do. But I also have been humbled so many times. And this has been a really humbling moment for me. I am the kind of mom, Hot Run and I have one kid who's now 35 and I am now a grandmother. Congratulations. Four week old grandbaby. Yeah. And I was the kind of mom, I'm the kind of mom that if my kid said, I'm going to go outside in 30 degree weather without a coat, I'd say, okay, knock yourself out because the consequence of that activity will probably color future decisions. Yes. 
And I told you, like with Frank, I was a slow learner. I, over and over, as I learned, I learned to ski, learned to windsurf. I wasn't the first one to pick anything up. I was always a little questioning. Sometimes smart people are slow, slow learners. I think that sometimes smart people uh, can be slow learners because they're so used to be being told they're smart that when they get information to the contrary in a certain situation, their immediate reaction is to reject it. Because it's like, well, I'm pretty freaking smart. Mm -hmm. I think that's one reason. Another is overthinking it. Yes. Like, this is how you do it, A, B, and C. Well, what if B doesn't work? You haven't even started. You haven't even tried it yet, you know, and you're already rejecting. I am that guy. So, you know, I have some uh, compassion for someone who's going to take a more circuitous route. I have learned over the years that if you keep planning, executing, debriefing, implementing, making some progress, you'll get there. Maybe it takes you five years to get to your three-year goals, but what difference does it make? And so I've been fine with that approach and with my my, uh, consulting clients over the years and now exclusively with my Zoom franchisees, I have been too cavalier in my accountability. And for that, I have to take the hit as an extreme ownership philosopher Within my circle of influence, what COVID-19 did is it took out the luxury of time. Yep. You know, it would have been nice if everybody had all those systems in place. It would have been nice if we had stockpiled the, the personal protective equipment that we needed. You know, these are things that have been on the list, but chopped, you know, we, that's not a good expression, but, you know, should have moved faster, should have moved faster to get it done. And I should have hold, held myself and others more accountable. Where are the consequences as opposed to being more casual about it to every level of the organization? Like if you are a fireman and you don't put on your helmet, you put everybody at risk. You can't go into a fire. Now the whole team's down. So in the same way, if we get this equipment and we do this training, if there is a team member who doesn't play, who lacks the willingness and the capacity to do what is required, you have to get them good or move them on. And that is like the real lesson for me in the immediate moment is that we just don't have the luxury of time because people's safety and financial survival are totally on the line right now. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, the thing that's breaking my heart right now about what's happening with COVID-19, um, and I'm happy you're bringing it up because a lot of these interviews on on the podcast this first season were recorded before it really broke out in the US, is that you know, if one of your technicians gets sick and they come back to HQ or if they interact with the rest of your company, guess what? Your whole company is now in quarantine. It's, it's a yeah. giant risk. And I can only imagine that having 18 franchise locations, you have to communicate that very real and present threat to those franchises, least they, be, they have to be cut off. So how are you, like, how have you had to pivot and change your style of leadership to really communicate with your franchisees and give them this direction while also recognizing that their franchises, they're not technically, you're not technically their, their boss. Right. So how, how do you navigate that like weird, crunchy area given what's happening right now with coronavirus? And it's going so fast. We made suggestions last week that are now directives. And that, so that brings me to one of our franchisees said this, and I'm so glad he did. And I love him so much. Thanks, Sam. Sam said that in tough times, he's been through some tough times too. So I called on him at our huddle last week and just said, you know, give us some words, man. You know, you've been through some tough times. What, what's coming up for you? And he said um, that a leader decides and you're not always going to decide right. And no light starts flashing that you made the right decision. And yet you can't live in self-doubt. You can't keep second guessing yourself and you can't avoid the decision. So you're going to have to make a decision and then get the consequences and move on. This cycle just has to go faster. You know, that's what has to happen. It has to happen faster. And I also feel like we have to, or we're well served to, nobody has to do anything. This is where I'm coming from. I am going to make an effort to be kind because this too will end. There will be another side. We're going to get to to dry land. And I'm going to start with the assumption that people are doing the best they can do with the information and understanding that they have right now. So I, if I expect that I've got to give that and at the same time, hold them accountable. And that is a paradox. 
That is a paradox when two things that seem to be at odds with each other are indeed both true. And that's what the most interesting pieces of life are and the most challenging moments of life are paradoxes. And that's what we have to navigate. So you're going to make mistakes and so am I. And then we still have to just keep showing up and making another decision and try to move forward with this. But the landscape is going to be different. It's going to be survive and thrive. And, you know, uh, at this point, we don't have a, um, that I know of, I don't have a documented case of COVID-19 yet. I cannot imagine that we won't by the end of the week. I just can't even imagine that. Of course we are going to by then. And, you know, just to even put out language that says, here's some copy for you to use at your shop if someone now has COVID-19. So like, this is all, it's a learning curve for all of us. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm going to make a million mistakes and I, you know, it is, it is stressful and it's nothing compared to what the frontline people are doing or the individual franchisees at their own locations are doing. So I still have the luxury of, thinking about that and trying to, to be supportive from the comfort of my home office, you know? So I, you know, it's really the frontline people, the, the tactical challenge right now. And that like, this will never happen to us again is the, um, the supplies. Oh, talk to me about that. Stockpile supplies. And, and we have to be careful. I don't mean hoard. I mean, coordinate in our local communities, what we can do for another disaster someday. You know, because even now, like if you have it, who needs it more? The triage of supplies is a very complex conversation right now. We need it. So do other people. So who's going to get it? Exactly. Exactly. It's very tricky. And I think that for companies like ZoomDrain, for a lot of Service Titan customers, a lot of our customers we're seeing are thinking ahead and what's happening now and what will happen in the next couple of weeks will define how processes are written. Going back to yeah. that giant manual that you were talking about, like what happens in this point in history will influence that. So it's just a matter of what you said, using what information you have now to make the best possible decision. And it just to keep faith when sometimes that decision is making a decision between two equally crappy options and weighing which one is the slightly less crappier. So yeah, I'm you know, so time. grateful we had the manuals and then just the relentless now, the upped standards in terms of communicating and drilling on them. Like it will say in the manual that you're supposed to wear a face shield, but what does that mean all the time? When you walk up to the door, when do you wash it between that? Or what do you wash it with? Like some of these nuances of the procedures, we just never, had in there before. And, you know, so we're in better shape than most that at least we had a start. And this is where, you know, just imagine if we rise to this challenge, if we survive as best we can, if we love each other through whatever losses and and challenges that are inevitably going to happen for our industry, thank God we are of service and we will survive. Like, I'm, I'm really glad that I'm not in a bouncy castle ball crawl party rental business. Yeah. You know where I'm going? Like they're one of our franchisees, their neighbor has the whole group of uh, hair salons, 11 hair salons are just shuttered. Friend of mine's in retail, three shops just shuttered right now. And I, you know, yes, they're home and safe. Yes. They're not going on the front lines, but the financial devastation of some of these situations is going to be real. Yeah, it totally is. There's always a, there is always, I am an optimist and there is always like the rainbows and the the slingshot recoveries. If you can just hang on to each other and day by day survive, there will be a thrive. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And not that, you know, one other thing is that not to make non-emergencies emergencies. I have throughout my conversations witnessed people dealing with similar situations escalate something that doesn't have to be escalated today. Yeah. Like what I heard the the acronym, a win is what's important now. Like what has to absolutely be done today? Could we not think about that today? Could that just triage till tomorrow? And that kind of thinking is, is going to be not only uh, essential right now, but think of the, the leadership skills that are being honed with this reality. This is completely, what's happening now is going to change, I think, uh, our economy and our culture permanently, 100%. It's changing me. 
Yeah, it's changing me too. I hope that there will definitely be some benefits to it, but it's it's kind of hard to see the the light at the end of the tunnel as we're, it seems like right in the beginning of the tunnel. But um, I can definitely see, if I were a franchisee of Zoom Drain, I would certainly be happy that you were giving me directives. I can tell you that for sure. I And I'm learning it from them because our frontline guys are the ones saying that won't work because, or this is what we need, or how do you use this piece? So those franchisees who are staying in good communication with their guys are allowing me to get the best of what they're, they're gathering and then disseminating it. So gathering the information, disseminating the information, or at least just steering them to the right websites. There are really good, credible voices out there. The CDC, IAPMO, um, ASSE, all the alphabet, the NAPHCC, your good vendors, you know, service tight. You've really like, you just stepped right up and said, here's how we're going to communicate with you. Here is some information that's going to be relevant. We're going to find experts and get them, you know, even today, like if you just got a little uh, humor, that would be worth it. Or some encouragement. Those are good things. And hopefully some of the tactics that we're employing to, um, to hold ourselves accountable for, for making it through tough times and, and uh, bringing the whole team together with yeah. us. So one thing that always I've always wanted to ask you about your history, having come from a place of financial turmoil with your, when you were working with your husband to now being a freaking COO, which is incredible. <laughs> I want to talk a bit about what you found with people's emotional reactions to money. Oh. Because in your, in your verbiage and in, in your talking, you equated it to, it's not as important as oxygen, but it's pretty high up there. And what I find is there's a lot of people that I think fear money and they fear looking at their financials. And there's a lot of stress and feelings of inadequacy and not being good enough that come with those, with those numbers. So I just wanted to throw that to you and see how you responded to that. Oh, 100. I mean, the math is easy. So let's look, like, look at somebody like my husband, Hot Rod, is a solar guru, a hydronics expert, world-renowned, delta T's and engineering formulas and these schematics and how all these mechanical systems work and they're moving water and electricity and fire and power and solar and all this stuff, like the amount of math and physics and science that is involved with what most contractors do is staggering to me. And the financials that apparently, and I'm being sarcastic here, seem to be so far over most contractors' heads, right, is literally sales bigger than expenses equals a profit. That is the math. So it has to be the emotional issues that keep us from doing it. Yeah. The math is not hard. You know, like it isn't the math that's keeping you from being good at your financials. But we will say that. We'll say, I'm, you know, I'm, I was never diagnosed this way because we didn't use words like that. But I'm kind of dyslexic. I have a hard time with numbers. I don't see things linear. It lin I can't even speak well. <laughs> <laughs> Disagree. But you just got yeah, tongue tied you know for I mean? a second. Yeah. Overcome. But like there, I'm not naturally good at numbers or columns. I was never interested. It was that I was dying and drowning and I couldn't find anybody else to do it for me. And then when I finally just, okay, I'll do it. I realized it's kind of fun. It's kind of like a puzzle. It's better to know than not know. I started to get some, you know, when you take a course, if someone drags you along a course of study here, just let me teach you how to ski, do this. Like instead of trying to flail on your own, just take a lesson, okay? And then you're going to be skiing. And then it, it's really fun to be skiing. Like you start to get some feedback from success right away. And that's what happened to me. And that's why I'm so, I try to be so encouraging. It's scary and all those emotional things will get in your way, but just have somebody sit next to you, have, explain what a balance sheet and a profit and loss is. That's why I wrote the book, Where Did the Money Go? How much should I charge? Those books are just explaining what's a balance sheet, what's a profit and loss, how to put a little budget and selling price together. That's all they do. And it's like that thin. I love it. Yeah. And so that was like, you know, once I started to get that I really understood that it was all those emotional things that daddy taught you never to talk about money, that mama always told you that money doesn't grow on trees and you don't deserve it. 
very spiritual people sometimes struggle with this idea of a man and a camel going through the eye of the needle. And I'm not very good at, at, at Bible quotes, but you know, you get the idea that if, if there is part of your belief system that would feel uncomfortable being a rich or successful person, it's going to sabotage. Hmm. Oh, that's and very what I just found like along those lines, like that's probably the most, you know, do what you love and the money will follow. That's not true. Agree. Um, you know, and uh, probably the most in city, you have to go charge the going rate. That's not true. The, the market bears all kinds of things. So there's these myths that are out there that we throw in the way, but probably the most insidious, there's two insidious myths. And the first one is that profits and principles don't mix. All through my career, I have found that profits allow you to maintain your principles. Mm-hmm. It is the opposite. So if you have the money, you will make your payroll tax deposit. If you don't have the money, you're going to do something weird. And how many people I know have been ripped off, like almost every business person in their career is going to get ripped off by someone. And it's usually by a really good person with their back against the wall. The owner's not paying attention. They take it. No one's looking. Then they start to justify it. It's an addiction. Theirs or someone else's and it escalates. And they are good people doing bad things, not because they, they're bad. It's because they have no money. Their options are limited and you drop your integrity. So having enough money makes it easier for you to maintain your principles. Yes, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah, and so that like some of these things, like, I th- I'm glad you brought that up because it really becomes the, the bigger reason why you're not to be willing to sit with that. Now I can even hear my hard boiled partners like Ellen, don't go all fluffy on people like that. But I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness I'm here. Those guys are so hard boiled. You know, so a lot of times in our industry, there's tough guys, but I think there is a lot of emotional stuff. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of Frank Blau said you can, um, uh, the problem in our industry is a self esteem problem. People don't think they're worth it. But they are, you know, it's, and I I think like you just brought it up, like the amount of math and science and physics that the trade, that trade work requires is staggering. Like the kind of stuff that trades men and women build is incredible. Mm -hmm. But there is this stigma. There is this feeling of being lesser than because it's blue collar when in actual, when in actuality, it's the foundation that our world is built on. And so I just, I find it very interesting, like as businesses maybe just have like two or three trucks out there and are trying to get started and have big aspirations, there's probably a lot of emotional baggage that gets attached to their financials. I mean, even when you said earlier, like when I looked at, when I told my husband, we're not making enough money, he took that as I'm not doing enough. I'm not being as good as I can be. And I'm not good enough. Yeah. And I feel like there's just, as you're starting a business, as you're navigating this world and trying to figure out how you can make yourself successful, how you can take your business and grow it or reach the goals that you want, you have to get real with the, one of my favorite authors, Brene Brown talks about a shame, shame, demon, shame monsters. You have to get real with the shame that's connected to the different aspects of your business, because there is going to be a lot of personal stuff that you bring into it regardless. And I was just, I figured that you being, you know, one of the more fine, one of the, you didn't say you were uh, one of the best financial experts, but I'm, I I consider you one of the best ones. I teach the basics, but that's why I, you know, it's really the encouragement so the second thing is one is there one is there's going to be this emotional baggage and it's going to have everything to do with your self worth, yeah. And to do the work required to get you know to to gain some understanding and work on that with your team members, you are worth it. I, I've had people you know in our organizations technicians quit because they don't feel they're worth three hundred four hundred dollars an hour. I, I I can't charge somebody for that, you know. Yeah. Just consider that. So what can we do to communicate the value of what we do times like these one of our service manager at zoom philadelphia or our general manager said the other day this is why we charge so much yeah like, you get this guys like this let, like let's not have this conversation anymore the second thing i wanted to point out is that it's not hard nothing in the world of financial literacy is hard by definition hard is something you can't do jim Rohn says easy is something you can do 
And every bit of figuring out your balance sheet and profit and loss is something you can do. So when we drop that, there's so many things in life that aren't hard. And even the things that are hard are kind of the good stuff. Like one of the things that I've done in my life is I've run a couple of ultra marathons. Why? Because they're hard. (laughs) That's why you do it. And on a hard day, that camaraderie that's built, like if you're at the shop at the end of the day and these guys come back and they were all day in some like really rough situation, they have a story now. They have, yeah. they have a shared experience now. And that's what, you know, they create families this way. That's what I love about the community of the trades. I love that back of the trucks, end of the day, beginning of the day moment where these guys are and gals are family. Yeah. And that comes through hard things. Yeah. So one, the financial part isn't the hard stuff. Maybe some of the repercussions of not having enough money, but the actual learning how to get your QuickBooks in order is not that hard. Yeah. You see where I'm going? And so then even if you were to go through a tough financial time, there are going to be people who someday in the, in the way out their future are going to look back at this moment as one of the best moments. Yeah. Because of how hard it was. Now I'm going to cry again. No, it's okay. Um, <laughs> Ellen, this has been an incredible conversation as always. Um, it's I so- love you. I feel like you're a soul sister. <laughs> I agree. Um, and I just find your career tr- uh, so inspirational. And I just, I love chatting with you. Is there I any- I give myself big titles and it totally works. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything that we should have talked about that we did it in regards to growing a service business, maintaining a team, achieving success, balancing money, any of that stuff? I, you know, I think, uh, I would encourage people to listen to your series, to listen to, to people who've done what you want to do. We're going to have a fresh perspective, have it on when you're driving or, you know, in your house or working, you know, don't listen to too much bad news. Try to fill your your head with stories of inspiration and hope wherever you can find them because we're going to need that. So thank you for providing that service to us. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you so much for being a guest on the Toolbox for the Trades, Ellen Rohr. The grit and know-how required to tackle your community's toughest jobs hasn't changed, but the way companies run their business has. Service Titan is the only field service software that was born in the trades, built for the trades. If you're interested in seeing what Service Titan can do for your business, request a demo at servicetitan.com slash trades, and we'll send you a new Milwaukee tool set, plus a free iPad when you sign up. That's servicetitan.com slash trades. You've been listening to Toolbox for the Trades, presented by Service Titan, the leading home and commercial field service software. Please subscribe to Toolbox for the Trades wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out servicetitan.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening.